Okay, welcome everyone. My name, as I said, is Erin Abramson. I am currently serving as the Deputy for Partnerships and Risk Management for the COVID-19 Policy Unit. And I would like to welcome you to today's CDC Partner Update Call on COVID-19. This call serves as a way um, for CDC to share weekly updates on COVID-19 and our latest resources and guidance, especially for the private sector and other partners. Today's call will focus on CDC's Spanish language resources as they relate to COVID-19. First, we will hear from our COVID-19 response chief medical officer about where we are with the response and what everyone should know about protecting themselves and others. Then, we will hear from our multilingual services team lead, I apologize, who will provide an overview and demonstration of CDC COVID-19 resources available to Spanish speakers. Then we will turn to one of our health communication specialists to discuss considerations for more effective COVID-19 communications that target Hispanic Latino communities. Afterward, our speakers will take questions from the audience. Please note that this call is intended primarily for CDC partners directly involved in the COVID-19 response and is not intended for media. Should media who are listening have questions, they are invited to reach out to media at cdc.gov. This call will be recorded and later posted on the CDC COVID-19 website, as well as on YouTube. All past partner calls can be found there. So please take some time to review and share prior recordings. If this is your first webinar with us, these weekly calls occur every Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please see the link in the chat box to subscribe to our mailing list to receive future COVID-19 partner update webinar invitations. Note that there are multiple listservs that support this call. So if you have missed an invitation over the last few weeks, please click the link in the chat box provided to ensure you are on the listservs. I would also like to take this opportunity to remind all participants that the CDC website has the latest information, guidance, and communication resources. There are over 2,000 documents providing information and guidance for individuals, businesses, and the public on our website. In addition to the tools we'll highlight today, some resources posted within the last week include new information for employers on case, case investigation and contact tracing, in non-healthcare settings. New information related to the recommendation, recommended duration of isolation and precautions for adults with COVID-19. New information related to travel during the COVID-19 pandemic. And updated data related to special populations in the US. CDC also has updated resources for rural communities, businesses and workplaces, and new tools and resources related to K through 12 schools and persons experiencing homelessness. Thank you to those who sent questions to us in advance. We have already teed up a few of those questions and I'll also be keeping an eye on the Q&A box. So please feel welcome to submit questions there as well. Note that we won't really be viewing the chat box, so please utilize the full functionality of the Q&A. I am pleased to be joined today by three CDC experts, Dr. John Brooks, the Chief Medical Officer for the COVID-19 Response, Claudia Kukuchka, CDC's Multilingual Services Team Lead, and Belen Moran Bradley, a Health Communication Specialist in the COVID, CDC COVID-19 Response Global Migration Task Force. Please note that today's call will feature more slides than usual, starting after Dr. Brooks's response update. Uh, if you experience technical difficulties or otherwise would like to review today's call later, once again, this presentation will be recorded and later posted on our CDC COVID-19 webpage and the CDC YouTube channel. Now, let's turn it over to Dr. Brooks for some updates. Well, good afternoon and thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. It's great to see so many people are on the call today with us. Um, I wanted to um, remind you again, my name is John Brooks. As mentioned, I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the COVID-19 Response and I'd like to provide a brief update on the COVID-19 response here at CDC and some of the latest scientific developments and guidance. So first, just a little uh, situational update and background. Globally, you may be aware that <clears throat> we are now over 19.8 million cases worldwide with 
uh, over 730,000 deaths as of August 10th. And here in the United States, we are now approaching 5 million confirmed and probable infections reported to CDC and tragically over 160,000 deaths. And these represent 25% of both all cases as well as all deaths reported worldwide since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, which also means that the United States has contributed more cases and more deaths uh, than any country to date. Encouragingly, recent data suggests that as a nation, we appear to be reaching a plateau in cases. I learned today that our total number of, <clears throat> or our average number of new diagnoses in the last seven days was 53,000, uh, compared to 62,000 in the, uh, seven week, the seven day period preceding that. So that's a 15% decrease uh, nationwide. But progress varies very substantially by state, some of which remain in the acceleration phase where cases and deaths are steadily rising, whereas others are plateauing and beginning to show declines. In fact, uh, as of uh, today, about 87% of states are starting to show plateau or decline. So that's some improvement. Deaths uh, typically lag behind changes in diagnosed cases, and we're still seeing deaths increase, although they may also be plateauing since early July. And that was the time, early July, when they were at their lowest since the original surge in cases earlier this spring. The duration and severity of this current phase of the pandemic will continue to vary by state, and achieving control will continue to depend on a strong public health response, including increased access to testing for those who need it, and widespread adoption of non-pharmaceutical interventions. And these include social distancing, hand hygiene, masking in public, and that's especially important when you can't stay six feet away from others. Uh, good hygiene with coughs and sneezes, so we'd like you to cover those, please, and avoid touching your face, as well as routinely dis disinfect high-touch surfaces, increase ventilation, and of course, monitor yourself and others for illness. And I encourage you, together with all my colleagues, to visit CDC's COVID View, which provides a weekly summary and interpretation of key indicators that have been adapted to track the COVID-19 pandemic here in the United States. So let me now turn to some scientific developments. I'd like to feature three reports published by CDC in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, or more affectionately known by us as MMWR. Scientists around the country and the world are working diligently to better understand how COVID-19 affects uh, illness, affects patients and communities. And the first report I'd like to feature is one from August the 5th, titled Serious Adverse Health Events, Including Death Associated with ingesting alcohol-based hand sanitizers that contain methanol. And this was in Arizona and New Mexico, May and June of 2020. Now we know that practicing hand hygiene is a very simple way to decrease the spread of SARS-CoV-2 and other pathogens. And if soap and water are not available, hand sanitizers that contain at least 60% alcohol are a convenient alternative. However, the type of alcohol used in manufacturing these products is important. There are different kinds of alcohol. Alcohol-based hand sanitizers should only contain either ethanol or isopropanol. But some products that are available in the, in the United States have been found to contain another kind of alcohol called methanol. Methanol is a very dangerous substance that can cause severe poisoning, whether intentionally or accidentally ingested. And this can include seizures, blindness, and death. In this investigation, CDC reported 15 cases of methanol poisoning caused by ingesting hand sanitizer. And these were, as I noted, reported from Arizona and New Mexico in the months of May and June. All of these persons required hospitalization. They were on average 43 years old, and 13 out of the 15 were male. Six of these persons developed um, seizures while they were hospitalized, four died, and three survivors had severe visual impairment. These cases highlight the really serious adverse health effects, including death, that can occur after ingesting alcohol-based hand sanitizer if it contains methanol. Um, and although most hand sanitizers are safe for disinfecting your hands, regardless of what they contain, alcohol-based hand sanitizers should never be consumed. They should be kept away from children and not in use as well. And we recommend the public check their products against the FDA's update on hand sanitizers uh, that consumers should not use. That's the title of the website. FDA updates on hand sanitizers consumers should not use. And you can find this at a um, website that we'll put up on the chat uh, momentarily. So you can go look it up yourself later if you'd like to. I'd also uh, now want to discuss um, a variety of other, another report from MMWR that was posted on August the 7th. And this focused on employees at meat processing facilities titled 
notes from the field, characteristics of meat processing facility workers with confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. And this was in Nebraska during April and May of 2020. So I'm sure many of you already know that workers in meat processing plants face substantial risk of COVID-19 due to the extended close contact required in that kind of a workplace. Many of you may be aware of the numerous outbreaks that have impacted meat processing plants nationwide. So this report was important because it went deeper to help characterize who these workers are and how they might have been exposed to SARS-CoV-2. So from May 8th to May 25th, CDC case, case investigators identified and interviewed 241 uh, meat processing workers who had tested positive for COVID-19. And among these workers, 57% were male, the median age was 41. And important for today's discussion, 46% were Hispanic or Latino. About half of the respondents worked on a conveyor belt where they were close to other workers. And interestingly, although three fourths of these workers reported having flexible leave policy and underwent regular fever and symptom screening, 29% still reported close contact with a visibly ill person or with a person who had been diagnosed with COVID-19 at work while only 13%, so 29 had this contact at work, but only 13% reported similar contacts outside of work. That said, approximately a third of workers with COVID-19 were asymptomatic. This means that although screening for symptoms like fever, cough, et cetera, are very important, we can't rely solely on symptoms of fever screening to prevent transmission in these uh, um, congregate settings. These findings highlight that we need to reduce work, workplace exposure among meat processing facility workers. This can be done by providing physical barriers between the workers, increasing the physical distance between the workers, and ensuring the cons consistent use of masks by everyone in the meat packing facility. Given today's topic, I'd also like to go out and go back rather and point out that a large proportion of workers in this industry uh, are Hispanic or Latino. And there's ongoing need for additional language appropriate and culturally appropriate communications materials and outreach to further prevent the spread of COVID-19 among these high risk meat processing workers. Lastly, I'd like to uh, highlight a third MMWR posted also August 7th, which focused on children. And this was titled Hospitalization Rates and Characteristics of Children Less Than Age 18 Hospitalized with Laboratory Confirmed COVID from a surveillance system called COVIDnet. These were reported from 14 states from March 1st, this, this, no, March 1st till July 25th. Now we know that most SARS-CoV-2 infections in children, that is in persons less than 18, are asymptomatic or mild, but less is known about the smaller fraction of children who develop severe COVID-19 and require hospitalization. So during the time span I mentioned, Data regarding 576 children hospitalized in, the four, in 14 U.S. states were reported to COVIDnet. And CDC's analysis of these pediatric hospitalization data found that although the cumulative rate of COVID-19 hospitalization among children was much lower than that in adults, it was 8 per 100,000 in children compared to about 164 per 100,000 in adults. So it was you know, 20 times less than adults still one in three of these hospitalized children required admission to the intensive care unit, so a measure of severity of disease, demonstrating that children are very definitely at risk for severe COVID-19. And to highlight some of the results from this report relevant to our topic this afternoon, COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates among Hispanic children were nearly eight times the rate of white children, and the rate among black children was five times the rate in white children. And Hispanic and black children also had had higher prevalences of underlying medical conditions that would put them at risk for more severe disease uh, than the white children. Hispanics, that rate was 46%. Blacks, that rate was 30%. I'm rounding up here. And for whites, that rate was 15%. Reasons for disparities in COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates by race and ethnicity are not fully understood yet. However, it has been hypothesized that Hispanic and Latino adults might be at increased risk for SARS-CoV-2 infection because they're overrepresented in these frontline occupations of essential and direct service workers. And they also have decreased opportunities for social distancing, which might therefore also place children living in their households at greater risk for exposure to and infection with SARS-CoV-2. Public health authorities and clinicians should continue to track SARS-CoV-2 infection and similar to the general population, children should also be encouraged to wash their hands often, continue social distancing, and for children uh, over the age of two, 
They should wear a mask when around persons outside of their families, including in childcare centers and schools. On a related note, I'd like to also point out that <clears throat> August 7th uh, last week kicked off the first ever World Mask Week, a week-long global movement to inspire more people to wear face masks to help stop the spread of COVID-19. CDC and the CDC Foundation are among the many organizations supporting this effort. Wearing a mask is one of the best tools we have, especially when paired with social distancing and hand washing. So with that, uh, it's now my very great pleasure to hand you over to my colleague, Claudia Kukuchka, to share information about CDC's Spanish language resources. Dr. Kukuchka. Thank you, Dr. Brooks and Dr. Everson for the introduction. Hello, I am Claudia Kukuchka, CDC's Multilingual Services Team Lead. Thank you all for joining us today. Today, um, I would like to show what COVID-19 resources are available in the CDC Spanish language website. This week, we're doing something a little different. Today's presentation involves screenshots of the CDC website that will show you our content and functionality. You can follow alongside if you would like to explore on your own. So let's get right to it. You can access the CDC in Espanol website directly from our default homepage at cdc.gov by clicking the Spanish language toggle in the upper right corner. Uh, first slide. You can see it over there on the corner. You can access the CDC in Espanol website directly from our default homepage, as I said, at cdc.gov. And, but you can also type the web address cdc.gov slash Spanish to get to that page. Next slide. Since, um, and next slide, slide, since we will be concentrated on COVID-19 resources, let's just click directly in the COVID-19 section to access the Spanish content. You can see it there on the screen. Next. This site is divided in sections for consumers, healthcare, and public health and communication resources. Next. Some of those sections are translated in real time as soon as the English pages are published or updated. This functionality applies to four languages, Spanish, Simplified Chinese, Korean, and Vietnamese. Those sections pertain to the main page, COVID-19 symptoms, COVID-19 testing, how to prevent getting sick, what to do if you are sick, and further information on daily life and coping, people who need extra precautions, travelers, communities, schools and workplaces, pets and other animals, and COVID-19 case updates in the data and surveillance section. You can see on the next two slides. Next, please. When new COVID-19 content is posted in those web pages, the system detects a content change and automatically sends the content for translation. The translated content is generally posted within one day, but it may vary depending on the volume and technical complexity of the information. This process is managed by the CDC web team. Next. There is a very useful tool called the Auto Verificador del Coronavirus, or as you might already know it, the CDC Coronavirus Self Checker that people can use to find out if their symptoms are related to COVID-19 and seek health care if needed. Next. The content of other sections, such as healthcare professionals, laboratories, CDC's response, global COVID-19, and communication resources are translated as needs are identified by the teams and staff working on our COVID response. We take care to meet the needs of our audience but also consider how often the information is updated when deciding what other sections to translate. And we work hard to make CDC's health information is accessible to a variety of populations. Next. Since the beginning of the response, we have translated materials into 57 languages. From those more common in the United States, like Spanish, French, and Portuguese, to others less common, like Wolof, Tamil, Kunama, and Karenpao. The products range from content hosted on the COVID-19 website to social media messages published in CDC social media channels, questionnaires and consent forms used in the field, and PowerPoint presentations used for training of healthcare workers and external partners. We also have provided over-the-phone interpretation services. 
and through our vendors, we have the capacity to translate into more than 100 languages. Although some content may take longer to translate, depending on the availability of our collaborating linguists. Next. Now, let's take a deeper look at some of the individual pages and its content. The communication resources page, Recursos de Comunicación, has a section called Printer Resources, or Recursos para Imprimir, with materials that you can download and print to use with your partners, communities, patients, or within your own organization. Next. You can filter by language and also by audience or topic, such as businesses, community settings, the general public, healthcare facilities, high-risk populations, home, schools, and travel. You can also combine searches. So for example, if I need materials in Spanish for community partners, I can select both Spanish and community settings and see that we have 28 items at the moment. Next. In this example, you may find this poster for kids called, Did you wash your hands? Te lavaste las manos. Or, next slide, a poster identifying the symptoms of COVID-19. We encourage you to share content from the printer resources page as a free and publicly available source of information for your communities and partners. Next. Our website also includes a section on videos related to COVID-19 which also have the search capabilities of sorting by language and audience. In the public service announcements page, you can find PSAs recorded in Spanish and grouped by topic. We have also included a link to the Ad Council PSAs if you're interested in those. Next. There are several other pages where you can find materials in languages different than English that you can print, although they may be organized slightly differently. The Communication Toolkit for Migrants, Refugees, and Other Limited English Proficient Populations has the languages already displayed so you can select the one you need without having to type it. And it also has links to the different pages with Spanish content. While this call is highlighting CDC Spanish language resources, we would like to note again, once again, that the printed resources page also has information in several languages other than English and Spanish that you may want to share with individuals, your own employees, communities, or other partners as needed. CDC is continuously adding critical health information to our website, but, do want, but we, I do want to note that the content in other languages apart from English may be posted on a delay. It does take some time for us to go through the translation process and to post the information. I want to point out that our translations are not done by a machine, but follow, follow a very thorough process that involves qualified professional translators, the use of translation software, and a quality assurance process that requires at least two translators and a three-step process of translation, editing, and proofreading. We also maintain a term base or glossary and follow a style manual to make sure the information is uniform. This guarantees that the content posted in Spanish is of the highest quality and is faithful to the source information. Also, because information posted on our website is geared towards the Spanish-speaking populations in the US, we try to use general and standardized ter terms as much as possible. However, this means that we may not be using the preferred term for a particular subset of the population. We do our best to use language that will be understood by the most broad audience possible. That said, we may localize the content if we know it will be used in a particular geographic area. So for example, we would use the word apagones instead of, pow uh, instead of corte de electricidad for pow power outages if we know that the document or the materials are going to be used in Puerto Rico. Either way, CDC continues working to improve the language accessibility of our COVID-19 science and guidance to support progress towards reducing COVID-19 morbidity and mortality among various populations. And with this, I complete this brief overview of the Spanish content in the CDC and Espanol website related to COVID-19. I will now hand you over to my colleague, Dele Moram Radley, 
to share information about health communication for Hispanic and Latino groups during COVID-19. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claudia. Gracias, Claudia. And thank you all of, to all of you for joining us today. My name is Belen Moran Bradley, and I will highlight the use of health communication and risk communication strategies for supporting Hispanic Latino communities during COVID-19. To start, I want to emphasize the need to know your audience. There is a critical need for effective crisis and emergency risk communication principles for all communities, including, including Hispanic Latinos. First slide, please. Thank you. Hispanic Latinos comprise 18% of the population in the United States. This population is growing, it is complex, and it is diverse in so many ways. On one end of the spectrum, some families span multiple generations and may be long established in their communities, while other community members may be young adults who recently, who recently arrived in the United States. There are also broad differences in financial power, citizenship status, and educational achievement. These huge differences, even within the Hispanic Latino population, means that there are also differences in health needs and access. For the sake of this presentation, let's focus on the Hispanic Latinos who are not fluent in English and sometimes have limited Spanish literacy. This means they may speak Spanish, but they may not read or write it. These individuals often prefer to receive health messages graphically and verbally. They might have access to only a few trusted sources of health information, because as I said, some are new to the United States and they don't know who those sources of health information are. They may consume traditional media like radio because they can listen to it while they work, but they also use new social media channels like Facebook and WhatsApp. It is important to be aware of this because the combination of how health information is shared and their available resources impacts how well they can follow COVID-19 recommendations. For example, some recomm recommendations are easier to follow, like wear a mask. Others are harder, such as isolate or quarantine in your home. Because in some cases, if you have six or nine family members or roommates in a two bedroom apartment, isolate, isolating or quarantining might, not be, might be very difficult. It is also important to note that communicating during a public health crisis is different than during normal times. In times of stress, your brain takes information and processes information differently. When you're facing a crisis, your initial reactions are emotional. Regardless of your ethnicity or race, that is just how our brain works. Adrenaline goes up and our fight and flight instinct appears. Therefore, if we know people are stressed, if we know their emotions are leading their decisions, our messages have to be simple and consistent. Next slide, please. Thank you. In order to address such challenges, I would like to highlight a specific CDC program that was developed more than a decade ago. The CDC Crisis and Emergency Risk Communication Program, or CERC, is based on emergency management, behavioral science, communication, and best practices. Fully integrated CERC helps to ensure that limited resources are managed well and can do the most good at every phase of an emergency response. There are six CERC principles, and you can see them in the slide. Be first, be right, be credible, express empathy, promote actions, show respects. And now I will go over each of them, each one of them. Number one, be first. Studies show that people will use the first message they receive to compare to other messages. It does not mean that they will believe 
the first message, but they will use it to see how it matches or differs from other messages they will be receiving. The messenger or spokesperson has a very important role. If your agency has information to share, do it before others fill the gap. If it's early in the response and you don't have a lot of information to, ser to share, there are three things you can say to show your agency's leadership. We are aware of the event, this is our role, and this is what we're doing. Example, we are aware that an infectious disease is affecting community members. Our role is to investigate this disease, and we have set up an emergency operations center. Number two, be right. Being right does not mean that you have answers for all the questions. It is an opportunity to show expertise. How? Share what you know, what you don't know, and what you're doing. Share the process that you're following to find the answers. For example, we know this is an infectious disease that's affecting those with weak immune systems. We don't know how this affects healthy adults. And to find answers, we are collaborating with our state partners. Number three, be credible. If you're honest and you make a mistake, people will forgive you. Again, you may not have all the answers, so you can say, based on the information we have now. And you may add that information is subject to change as we learn more. Express empathy. And when I, when I give workshops about crisis and emergency risk communication, I get a lot of questions in, in this in this principle. Um, expressing empathy is very important. Recognize what people are feeling. This will beat report and trust. Studies show you should express empathy in the first 25 seconds of your speech. Now, empathy and sympathy are different. Sympathy is expressing what you are feeling about what has happened to the other person. For example, I am sorry for your loss. Empathy is putting in words what the other person is feeling. For example, it must be hard to lose somebody when you love. It is expressing that you understand what the other person is feeling or going through. You can use sympathy and empathy, but you must always use empathy. Number five, promote action. People want to feel part of the response and might ask, what can I do? Some leaders fear sharing bad news will create panic. And we have in our mind the idea that panic is when people in, run in different directions with their hands up in the air screaming. But the real definition of panic is when people freeze and don't act. So if people are going to act, you want to promote simple science-based, evidence-based actions, such as wearing a mask, washing your hands. These simple actions empower people and let them know there are things they can do, regardless if there's still a lot of uncertainty about the disease. And finally, show respect. Everyone wants to feel respected regardless of age or education or financial power. Old fashioned customer service says, treat others the way you want to be treated. But now we say, treat others the way they want to be treated. To achieve this, you have to listen to your audience concerns. Use words and graphics that allow them to understand what you say and follow your recommendations. Next slide. Thank you. And, and, and to finish, I just want to finish with a quote from Dr. Barbara Reynolds, who was um, CDC CERC author and a mentor for me. And the message is, the right message at the right time from the right person can save lives. Thank you, gracias, over. Thank you so much for that, and that is a, is an incredible message for all of us right now, and I really appreciate that. Um, I would I would like to move into a little bit of question and answer with with all of our experts, um, and I 
I would like to start with a few general questions that we tend to get and I think uh, might help to clarify um, some things. Uh, if I could start with Dr. Brooks, could you please um, explain for us what exactly is community spread? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, so community spread refers to our understanding of how infections spread in a community. Uh, community spread is measured by determining how many people have been infected with the virus in the area, including some who are not sure or how, not sure of how they got infected or know where they became infected. And each health department or investigating group determines community spread differently based on local conditions. Um, for information on community spread in your area, uh, you can visit your local health department's website. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about um, also what, what exactly do we mean by community mitigation? Right. Okay. So community mitigation activities are actions that people and communities can take to slow the spread of infectious diseases in their community. These actions can also be used to prepare to prevent the spread of an infection if it occurs. Community mitigation uh, is especially important uh, before a vaccine or a drug becomes widely available because that may be the only tool you've got at that time. Uh, individuals need to follow healthy hygiene practices to limit the spread of an infection. These include staying at home when sick, practicing physical distancing to lower the risk of disease spread, and using a face mask with some exceptions in community settings when physical distancing can't be maintained. I see. Okay. Very helpful. Okay. I have one or two more for you um, that okay. both have to do with um, antibodies, questions about antibodies that we've been getting. Um, does having antibodies mean that you are immune to COVID-19 and that you can't give it to others? Yeah, thanks for that. You know, this is, whoever asked that question probably uh, is experiencing a lot of the um, confusion that many of us and other folks have about what do these antibodies that we're detecting that are against uh, COVID or the virus, SARS-CoV-2, what do these mean? So just in general principles, people develop antibodies after an infection and a positive antibody test is presumed to indicate that the person who was tested has been infected with the infection, in this case, SARS-CoV-2, and that's the virus that causes COVID-19 at some point in their past. It does not mean they're currently infected, and that's the first point, is they shouldn't be used for making a diagnosis. Unfortunately, we're only seven months into this brand new infection with a pathogen we've never seen before, and we currently don't have enough information yet to say whether somebody will definitely be immune and protected from reinfection if they have antibodies to the virus. We also don't know, uh, we also rather know that not everyone seems to develop detectable antibodies after infection. A recent study suggested that somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of folks uh, may, not actually, may develop no antibodies, even though they had a uh, diagnosed infection by the, another test called PCR. Until scientists get more data on how we develop immunity against the infection and whether antibodies help protect us, everybody should continue to take steps to protect themselves and others regardless of their antibody test. And this includes staying at least six feet away from other people outside your home, that's social distancing, uh, as well as the other measures that we've all been mentioning up till now. And I should also add that this also applies to people who wear personal protective equipment uh, at work or otherwise. They should continue to wear PPE, even if they test positive for antibodies to the virus until we know more about what those results mean. Importantly, and these are the two points I really wanna make, Antibody test results should not be used to determine if someone should return to work. And antibody test results should not be used to group people together in settings like schools, dormitories, or correctional facilities. So try to separate the people who may have had the infection already from those who haven't. Um, there's a lot about how to, we have a lot of information about these antibody tests and we can post, uh, I'll try, i see if I can uh, put it up on the screen for everybody, the website on how to use antibody test results for COVID-19. Thank you for that. And um, we definitely, we've been getting this question from a lot of different angles. And I think that might be the most concise um, information that I've seen on it. Um, and especially the idea that antibody tests should not be used for making a diagnosis. They're different. And um, I've got one more along this line, and then I will I'll give you a break. Um, 
So if hey. someone tested, <laughs> I promise, and I it's apologize. Okay. No, these are great. These are great questions. Yeah. Get these I apologize if people can hear the thunder in the background. I would love to get through one of these Monday calls without an, an enormous thunderstorm. I don't know who else is experiencing this. Um, so if someone tested positive and had many of the symptoms of COVID-19, why would their antibody test come back negative? Yeah. Another good question. So let me first re reiterate what I said before, that we really don't yet know how to interpret uh, antibody results, whether they're positive or negative. And as I said, we know that if you're positive, that that probably means you've had the infection, but we still don't know what it means if you're protected. So to your question though, if it's negative, it could mean a couple of things. It could mean that you never had the infection, so you've never had it. Or it could be too soon after the infection for antibodies to develop yet. You know, once you get infected, it takes some time for your body to make the antibodies. Maybe you're in that window period. Now, most antibody tests are very accurate and the good ones are over 95% accurate, but it's nearly impossible to be perfect. And these tests can on occasion rarely give a falsely negative result. So you're actually infected, but the test says you're not. Or you've had the infection rather, and the test says that you have not. Lastly, as I mentioned before, some people appear not to develop antibodies despite infection. We don't know why some people don't develop these antibodies. Um, and we also don't know more importantly, I think the question that's a million dollar question right now is, um, in the, if a person who doesn't have antibodies following a natural infection, um, if, you are, if you will be as immune to the reinfection as a person who may develop antibodies. This is a whole area of, work we're trying to do with people around the world to understand what these antibodies mean and if having had natural infection, you're protected against reinfection. Thank you very much for, for helping us understand that um, a little better, just as much as we can right now. I appreciate that. Um, I have a couple questions now uh, for Belen. Um, the first one, and I apologize in advance because I know that I am not going to say this the right way, but we are getting this question uh, in the Q&A and the chat box, and I know I've heard it asked before. Um, can you help us, Belen, understand the correct terminology around Hispanic, Latino, Latin, Latinx? Um, what, what is the proper terminology that we should be using, uh, or what is CDC using and why? And Please correct me if I'm stating this the wrong way. No, it's correct. We go by what the census uses. We go by Hispanic Latino. Um, Hispanic refers to those who speak Spanish. Latino refers to those that come from Latin America. So it includes also people from Brazil who don't speak Spanish. Um, I know CDC, I think some HIV programs are already using Latinx, but most of CDC is still using what the census uses, which is Hispanic Latino. That is very helpful and much more uh, concise than I could have pulled together, and I really <laughs> appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and another question for, for you, Villain. Um, you mentioned that some COVID-19 recommendations are harder to follow. Uh, many households have extended families living under one roof, including children and grandparents. Um, how might you quarantine in a multi-generational home? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, in uh, some, I, I deployed to Kansas during COVID-19 and I have been from headquarters in Atlanta. I have been providing support to different communicators that have deployed to other states. And we learned that many cities and counties in the U.S. set up COVID-19 free temporary shelters in hotels and community colleges for people that live in small quarters. And, and this was this was set up to help them isolate and quarantine away from their homes. Um, CDC also developed a guidance called titled Large or Extended Families Living in the Same Household. And it has been translated, of course, to Spanish and many other languages. And the recommendations in this guidance, that it's also a fact sheet, include um, separate the sick person, have only one household member help the person isolating or quarantining, you know, taking food, taking water, have the person who's isolated and quarantined wear a mask even at home, especially when they're around other people, and make sure that everybody cleans the bathroom, the kitchen, and other common areas 
with um, with a uh, with a Clorox or Lysol after they after they use it. And I don't know. We can put the maybe I can put the link of the yeah. of the of the. Oh yes, we should yeah. be able to add that link uh, into the chat box. I think. Yeah. Let me see if I can. Absolutely. Um, or some one of us can do it for you. I think. There I, we go. There, yeah, and, and and for example, the state of Kansas grabbed that poster, and I think it's like five pages long. And the state of Kansas grabbed the last part, turned it into a two-page graphics, and and this is what Claudia was saying. You, we put the information out there, and you can use it mm -hmm. as it best fits your community. That's wonderful. I mean, I have three small kids. There are only five of us, and I couldn't imagine right now how we would actually make this work functionally if we had to isolate mm -hmm. um, one of us. So that's a lot to figure out. Um, I have another question for you. Um, so coping with everything right now feels very overwhelming. And some of us are feeling a lot of stress and anxiety. I can't say that I'm not. Um, so how can I cope with the stress and anxiety brought on by this pandemic, the feelings of so social isolation and added caregiving responsibilities? It is tough. It is really tough for everybody. And we all have, you know, <laughs> you just expressed that you're going through that. I am also going through that. I think that being able to express what we are feeling, accommodating, our our schedules the best way we can if you are a community leader and you know your community is going through this express it in words say we are concerned we are stressed we are going through a very uncertain times and very difficult times but we can do this together we can and, and let them know what is it that they can do. It can be science, scientific recommendations like wear a mask, stay six feet apart, um, you know, isolate or quarantine if you have been near somebody that's sick. But it also could be other things like take a walk, listen to music, read a book. I think that we have a web page and we're also going to try and find in about how to cope with a mental stress during, during a stressful and crisis times. And I will try to find it and also put it in our, in our chat. Yeah, we can absolutely, um, we can put that link up, definitely. And I think one of the things also <laughs> that I try to uh, take our own advice sometimes um, in terms of we're all taking care of others and um, making sure that we're still taking care of ourselves and taking breaks from watching and reading and listening to the news as hard as it is um, because hearing about everything repeatedly can can lead, be very upsetting sometimes um, even though I try to stay connected to everything. So we appreciate all of that. Um, can you tell me a little bit, Claudia, about CDC's recommendations for hurricane preparedness during COVID-19? I know that this is an added layer to everything. Um, somebody has asked us, um, I'm worried that evacuating to a shelter will expose me potentially to COVID-19. Um, CDC has set up a web page with information for hurricanes and COVID-19, and we can put a link on, on the chat box. And CDC also has developed a guidance on what to do if you go to a public disaster shelter during the COVID-19 pandemic. Both of those resources are also in Spanish. Um, and we're also sharing social media messages with the CDC recommendation. Um, if you may need to evacuate, uh, prepare a recommendation is to prepare a go kit with personal items that you cannot do without during the emergency. And in, in that kit include items that can help you protect uh, from uh, you and others from COVID-19, such as hand sanitizer that has at least 60% of alcohol, a uh, bar of liquid soap, disinfectant wipes if available, and um, a recommendation to have two masks for each person, and also to try to stay at least six feet from people outside of um, that are not living with you while you are um, at the shelter.
um, also uh, make a plan and prepare a disaster kit for your pets. I know sometimes, and you know, we we don't know what to do with them, so that's a good uh, opportunity to to prepare in advance and and know what to do. Talk to your family members so everybody knows what to do uh, in case you are not together at the moment. Um, definitely practice social distancing. Um, and follow CDC COVID-19 preventive actions, wash your hands often, cover coughs and sneezes, and, and follow the shelter policies for wearing masks, and also avoid sharing food and drink with anyone if possible. That's incredibly helpful, and um, some of those things I have thought about, but a few of those I hadn't, so thank you for that. Um, yes, I want to um, ask this question to Belen. Um, is mask wearing generally accepted among uh, Hispanic and within, I guess I should say, the Hispanic and Latino community? Um, and I may have asked that to the wrong person and I'm sorry if I did. Oh no, I'm in mute. Oh. <laughs> I'm in mute. <laughs> this is difficult, the, all the virtual right. and the technology. Um, Belen, do you want me to? I can give some of our input here while Belen gets uh, uh, out of mute. <laughs> uh, mute. Um, and, and one thing that we know is uh, the Hispanics and Latinos, the same way that some, some of us like to be called Latinos and some of us like to be called Hispanics, uh, we are diverse. So some people have accepted and, and, and some people may be reluctant to do it. Um, but um, it's important to understand um, the reason for that. Um, some people may feel that if uh, they wear the mask, then they may think that they are sick. So uh, they may be reluctant to use it because uh, at work it may be something that uh, they may be worried that they may lose jobs. Um, Belen, do you have, uh, are you back? So in general, I think that, that we have uh, different uh, approaches based on the, the community you, we are in. Um, I'm gonna go by, uh, we were talking with Belen and that's what I jumped in before and she was mentioning that um, in, in, in Kansas, um, uh, one of the labor unions developed um, a great Hello? poster. There. Oh, are you there? I am. Okay, but, yeah, I am. Belen, I was, I was talking about the poster you were mentioning before, so if you wanna take it from there. Oh. Yeah, I, I am so sorry. It has started raining here and I couldn't go back and mute my <laughs> microphone. And thank God that- You're that fine, I already something. told them about the storm. Yeah. So you're fine. Yes, so yes. Yeah, so, so the last question I heard was about the masks. And yeah, I was now, asking yeah. you if you thought that um, mask wearing was generally accepted across uh, Hispanic Latino communities or within the culture. And um, Claudia was explaining that just like the rest of us, you know, it's not all the same. We're not all the same. Everybody has different reasons and preferences, but she was going to, um, we were going to have you talk about your example real quick. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, I deployed to, to Kansas earlier this year to an area where there are like four or five meat packing comp, um, meat packing plants. The majority of the workers are Hispanics. And they were finding out that people were wearing masks at work, but not in the community. At work, they were getting paid extra to wear the mask as, you know, as, as hazard pay and PPE, extra PPE. So the, the union labor in that area came up with an excellent campaign. It was a poster of Lucha Libre masks. And the last mask was a surgical mask and just a simple message that said, be a superhero, wear a mask. Also, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, um, to address this issue, they have, uh, if you go to their website, they have a poster that they did in different languages and with people, uh, you know, Hispanics, Black, Asians, Whites, that says, thank you for wearing a mask. I thought it was splendid because it's a positive, positive way. It's not an order, wear a mask, but mm -hmm. it's a, th 
thank you for wearing your mask. And our partners, because, you know, we, we at CDC, we do really good work, but let's also highlight our partners. Oklahoma Department of Health has done PSAs that are short PSAs in Spanish and English with different people, male, females, speaking, saying, and, and that it's a short PSA that ends with something like, I will, I will wear a mask to protect you. Will you wear a mask to protect me? So we are diverse, but there are um, campaigns that have been done. And um, I am sure that, that you can come up with something similar, like they have come up with over. Absolutely. And I think that's where we give one more plug for World Mask Week that is running through, um, uh, on, I don't remember yes. what month we're in, August 14th. August. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, this global campaign. Um, I have another question really quick for Claudia. We'll see if we can get through one or two more of these. Um, how are you and your staff using health literacy concepts to better communicate with the public and in particular with racial and ethnic minorities? Uh, great question. Uh, it is critical that public health information is provided in languages spoken by the intended audience. Clear communication means using familiar concepts, words, numbers, and images presented in ways that make sense to the people who need the information. We work closely with the programs during the translation process. When we receive materials for translation, we alert them if we notice that its content may not be appropriate for the specific audience. This could be, for example, because they are using images that may be confusing, have no meaning, or may be offensive to some. Also, during the translation process, we work in teams and we are constantly gathering feedback from other team members regarding terminology. Is this term known by the majority of the Spanish speakers? Even if they don't use it, will they understand the message? Can we find another option that may be better understood? We also reach out to other staff with CDC who are sp Spanish speakers to get their input. And even after the translation is finished, we receive feedback from the field and make changes based on the recommendations. We just recently finished uh, a, a questionnaire survey that is geared towards uh, teenagers. Uh, we completed translation, we, we went through all the steps. We got feedback from um, some of the people who will be implementing the survey in the field. And, that was a very valuable um, feedback, information that, you know, make the product a better product. So that, that's our goal, to be able to provide to the community the best information in the language that they can understand. For the COVID-19 response, we are also testing a checklist and guide for cultural and linguistic, uh, linguistic appropriateness of translated materials to incorporate in our process. We're doing it after the translation is done because of the urgency of, of the communications that we had to translate now. Um, and uh, our goal, as always, is to provide a translation that best convey the English health messages. But it's a very dynamic process with a lot of people participating. One more thing I, I wanted to add, that since our information aims to reach the general public, uh, you know, the information posted on the CDC, um, the organizations that are working directly with the ethnic minorities know best the audiences they are servicing. So the information on those CDC website, which is in the public domain, could be adapted to meet the individual needs of your audience. Um, so as, as Belen mentioned, if you see information that will be uh, available for your organization, but that needs to be tweaked here and there to match to your particular audience, you can do that. The only thing where we ask you is that, you know, if you modify any form in any form our documents to remove the logo, but that information can be extracted and can be used in your, um, in your information for your communities. Thank you so much for that. That is very helpful. I have one very quick question for, no, I guess this is not a quick answer, but for Dr. Brooks, um, because I think this is very important. Are there any COVID-19 rapid blood tests? And I may have lost our yeah, I found, uh, I found my, no, I found, I had go, I was doing I like everybody him. else. We're all, we're all in stun. Yeah, we're obviously, we're all struggling trying to get these mute buttons today. Hi, oh, yeah. sorry about that. Yeah. So, um, uh, th uh, there aren't any, any rapid tests, uh, sometimes are also referred to also as point of care tests. If the test is done at the place that the specimens collected, like the bedside or in the clinic or something like that. And that is the, that is really the, um, one of our, um, 
goals in life when we do testing is to develop <laughs> testing that's fast and rapid and right there. And we're trying to get there. I'm not sure that for, uh, certainly for diagnosis with the PCR-based test, that's not possible to do with a point of care or rapid test presently. There are some tests that look for a different um, substance, an antigen that's in the virus, uh, that would be could be used for diagnosis. Two of those have been given uh, permission by FDA to use on an emergency basis, but um, there have been some glitches with uh, at least one of those, and so they're trying to work that out now, but that's another promising technology, and that operates with the technology that you could potentially make it a rapid test and use it at the point of care. And there also are some antibody tests being developed for point of care use that, are, that could be very useful for helping us understand who's had infection, but those wouldn't be useful for uh, diagnosis yet. And we're looking forward to all of these having their sensitivity and specificity and all their other performance characteristics improved as time goes on. Thank you for that very rapid answer. I really appreciate it. All right. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining our call today. Like we said before, a recording will be posted online on CDC's COVID-19 webpage. Uh, our subscription link to re receive future updates and invitations is listed in the chat box. So go ahead and click away on that. And thank you all again. Please join us next week. We will be discussing uh, CDC's new COVID-19 uh, resources for schools. I appreciate everyone's attention. Have a great afternoon.